I'm very pleased to be able to present this to you, information on human trafficking. Today we have with us Christine Tervanek from the uh, Center for Civil and Human Rights. She's the Associate Director there here at Notre Dame's um, so Center for Civil and Human Rights, and she's a concurrent assistant professor of law. She has experience in international law, conflict resolution, and human rights. At the University of Notre Dame, her teaching and research focus on issues of human trafficking. She served in the Office of the Legal Advisor of the U.S. Department of State as Legal Officer for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency's West Bank Operations and with the UN's Peace Operation in El Salvador. She worked extensively in conflict resolution, consulting to such clients as the Asia Foundation, Harvard Law School's Program on Negotiation, and USAID. Before joining the university in 2010, she was the director at the University of Chile's Law School Human Rights Center. A Notre Dame graduate in 1982, she studied at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, earned a, date, earned a JD from UCLA, clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and was a visiting fellow at Harvard Law School's Human Rights Program. In 2001, she was honored by Notre Dame with the Reverend John J. Cavanaugh CSC Award. She and her husband, husband Steve Reifenberg, are the parents of Natasha, a 2018 class of Notre Dame, Alexandra, and Luke Reifenberg. We also have Sister Anne A. Strike of the Immaculate Heart of Mary Order, based in Monroe, Michigan. She's with the U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking as a secretary and board member. She's also a U.S. representative with the Talitha Coom International Coordination Team. Sister Anne A. Strike has served as an educator, school administrator, communications director, and justice and peace coordinator. For over 25 years, she has ministered full-time in social justice and systemic change work. She served as director of the Center for Justice in Buffalo, New York, and most recently as congregation justice coordinator for the Sisters of Holy Cross, an international congregation based in Notre Dame, Indiana. Since 2007, she has concentrated on anti-trafficking initiatives, including shareholder activism with several companies and educational outreach in partnership with various groups such as LCWR, the Indiana Attorney General's Office, the Human Thread, and many churches, colleges, and universities. In 2011, she coordinated the outreach to over 200 hotel properties in preparation for Super Bowl 46 in Indianapolis. Sister Anne is a member of the U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking Board of Directors and the Executive Committee and serves as the U.S. Representative to the Talitha Coom International Coordination Team. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Chris, and she will give us a little bit of information about what we'll be covering today. Thank you, Annie, for those kind introductions. Uh, it's terrific to be here, and I want to welcome everyone who's joined us on this webinar. So Sister Anne and I together have come up with a sort of roadmap for this hour, an hour feels like not enough time to talk about human trafficking, but we'll do our best to walk you through a lot of highlights. So first we'll give you a sort of human trafficking 101, the basics of human trafficking today. We'll talk about the work of the Catholic Church in addressing modern day slavery, especially the work of Catholic women religious. Talk a little bit about what's happening at Notre Dame on human trafficking and direct you to resources about what you can do and how you can learn more and become um, more plugged in into uh, what we're doing on human trafficking. And then we'll also have time at the end, we hope, to take questions. We've, we've scheduled at least 10 minutes, if not more, uh, for questions. And um, so we can start the presentation. Yeah, first slide. There we go. So we're talking about human trafficking, but I want to just let everyone know that there's a number of terms that are used that we tend to use interchangeably when we talk about human trafficking. It's also known as trafficking in persons, modern day slavery, or contemporary slavery. What you find, though, is that there are some experts and scholars who believe strongly and vociferously that certain 
terms should be used for this phenomenon, but we'll be using them interchangeably as, as most people involved in human trafficking do. So um, the first point, I'm moving through. Here we go. Human trafficking today. And there we go. The first point I'd like to make is that people are still born in to slavery. This uh, might come as a surprise, but unfortunately, chattel slavery, the kind that existed in the United States uh, um, before the Civil War, still exists in pockets around the world. Um, in Mauritania, for example, it's estimated that 4% of the population is enslaved. They are in the kind of slavery where they are born into, die in, um, and they're really trapped in slavery where they are transferred among owners. If they run away, they are uh, retrieved and brought back. Chains are still used. And so in, in Mauritania, for example, there's a situation where this old fashioned slavery is still alive and well. Also in other pockets of the world, for example, in India, we know that there are um, whole families, if not villages, that are trapped in forms of hereditary slavery. Again, they are born into that slavery and are likely to die in it. Um, and so that's one of the first points to make is that people are still born in this, in this traditional form of slavery. Um, but we've tracked a new phenomenon that we typically call human trafficking, which we um, see as coming with globalization, dating to the fall of the Berlin Wall, especially in the 1990s, that with the freer flow of goods and services and people, there were more opportunities for exploitation. And um, Kevin Bales, there we go, um, is a scholar activist who in the 1990s got wind of this, these, this idea that more and more there were new forms of exploitation that were being identified. And he went to a number of countries and documented very carefully um, the kinds of uh, mechanisms through which people were trapped into different kinds of slavery, sex slavery, um, labor trafficking, and others. And so he wrote a book that I would recommend to anyone interested in the 90s that is used, I know in the traffic and in the human trafficking classes on campus, we all use this book, uh, Kevin Bale's Disposable People. And he said, I think he put the, his, his finger on it when he said that globalization's promise of wider markets and greater profits had created complex new networks and even new forms of exploitation. So what, where do we find trafficking today? Where is it manifested? Um, we believe that almost no human endeavor isn't touched some way by human trafficking. So it, whether it's mining our minerals and gems, harvesting timber, making charcoal to run steel plants, taking care of our elders or our children, growing and harvesting food or cotton, cleaning hotel rooms, grooming golf courses, painting nails, braiding hair, cleaning homes, catching shrimp, preparing food. You get the sense of where I'm going with this, that we, we, that, and that is a subset of the kinds of human endeavor that we believe are, are um, influenced by human trafficking today. So in the late 90s, as our international community was becoming aware of this problem of human trafficking, something quite inspirational happened. The international community pulled together and with the leadership of many countries, including the United States, negotiated, signed, and ratified an international treaty that pulls the international community together to fight human trafficking. It's called the Palermo Protocol. That's the shorthand we use for this, this anti-trafficking treaty because it was signed in Palermo um, in December of 2000. So what did the Palermo Protocol do? It first um, defined human trafficking as a crime. And so the exploitation of people in slave-like conditions is a crime that the international community recognizes. Um, it also went beyond our typical understanding of slavery, which involves force. Um, traditional slavery we recognize as involving shackles, chains, violence, locks, um, these, these kind of uh, indicators of, of regular slavery. But what the international community did was recognize that, well, there are invisible chains and invisible shackles that trap people just the same in situations of slavery. Um, and so fraud and coercion were added to the ways that, in which people can be trapped into slavery. So what do those invisible um, shackles look like? And I'll use an example of 
debt bondage, which is a very common way that people get trapped into trafficking. Someone is looking for a job, and um, right off the bat, that someone takes out a loan to pay a recruitment fee that might be illegal and is often is illegal in different countries. It pays a very high recruitment fee and then has to travel to the job and pays um, inflated travel um, charges to, to get to the job. And then once in the job, is charged um, for all the basic needs, housing, um, food, um, and health care. And so before one knows it, that person would be trapped in a situation of having a, a, a hugely inflated debt, often with false accounting, that they could never pay off. And that is a, an enormous way that people are trapped in trafficking today, through this debt bondage, um, where you have fraud and coercion being used, um, and maybe not so much force initially. So this, this treaty also um, identified the 3P approach to fighting human trafficking, to prosecute um, the criminals, those the traffickers who are involved in trafficking, to protect the victims and survivors of trafficking, and to work to prevent trafficking at its roots. Um, since 2000, in the last 16 years, we've added a fourth key to this, the 3P, the 3P approach, with, which is partnership realizing that without collaboration across borders and across sectors, that trafficking cannot be addressed. And Sister Anne will talk a lot. The example of the Catholic women religious um, on their, their success in building partnerships is illustrative here. We also, oh, shoot, I go back, all right. <laughs> also, with the international community recognizes clearly that there's labor and, and sex trafficking that um, uh, is part of this problem. In the definition, the Palermo Protocol, they also mention forced organ removal as a type of human trafficking that's a form of modern trafficking. And, and the definition is actually open-ended enough that other kinds of phenomena can and, be, and have been um, interpreted to being illegal under the Palermo Protocol. So um, child soldiers, forced marriage, um, forced adoptions, forced begging, these kinds of practices have been brought by the international community to be included under um, what we are fighting when we fight human trafficking. I also just want to mention too that when we talk about human trafficking, we don't need movement. That word trafficking uh, suggests movement in English especially, right? Especially when we think of drug trafficking, an earlier term that was used. Um, but human trafficking does not require movement. One can be born into a situation of slavery-like exploitation, um, one can be trafficked within their own home, within their own community. Movement is not needed. There is the separate practice of smuggling, um, which is a different um, crime, which can all sometimes go hand in hand with trafficking, but doesn't always. So um, I just want to make clear that this is a distinction that gets muddled a lot with the media. They, they make the mistake of calling human trafficking um, what, is really just, what is really human smuggling. So what are we talking about when we're talking about human trafficking in terms of numbers? We're dealing with the black market. So we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty and can't really get our arms around ex ex any, with any exactitude what, what, um, the, ex what the nature of human trafficking is in terms of its, its re reach and breadth. Um, and the estimates in the 1990s when we were starting to understand and, and study the phenomenon were pretty wild. And in fact, a number that was typically used in the 90s was 100 million people were trapped in slavery. Um, thanks to the International Labor Organization, um, a, more, a bit more rigor has been introduced to our numbers. And so the International Labor Organization uses this, this number of 21 million, which is what I like to use. Um, but recently, Walk Free Foundation um, put up, increased that number to be 45 million. So the Walk Free Foundation promotes this idea that there's about 45 million people trapped in trafficking. So you'll hear today numbers between 21 and 45 million in terms of the total. And I, I want to share with you this um, International Labor Organization map of generally how many people are estimated to be um, trafficked um, by region. And you see that huge number in Asia, almost 12 million people. Um, the majority of the 21 million we talk about are in Asia. Why is that? A lot of it is attributable to people who are in, in ancestral or hereditary um, situations of trafficking, so whole villages and huge swaths of the population being um, trapped. 
but you also have sex trafficking and other the more traditional kinds of, tra of modern day trafficking. And then after that, you see Africa, a distant second, but um, as the second region with the most trafficking. And in terms of numbers, I don't have a slide for this, but I'll just walk you through. Um, oh, oh, wait, no, I do have a slide for this. It's this, it's the pie chart. You know, we often, especially in the United States, think of, when we think of human trafficking, we think of sex trafficking. But the ILO um, numbers show us that sex trafficking, which is that red part of the pie chart, is actually um, not the major way, uh, type of trafficking that people experience today. The majority are in some form of forced labor. So you see that that blue plus that yellow is, um, is what we estimate to be the total population trapped in some kind of forced labor versus the red pie slice being that uh, sex trafficking. And we estimate that fit about 56% of people are exploited where they live. So just, again, undercutting that idea that any movement is needed. 56% well, are exploited where they live. 55% are female. So the flip side of that is 45% are male. And what we've come to grapple with and understand more just in the last few years is that men and boys, too, are very much victims of sex trafficking. Um, but they're mainly the victims of labor trafficking. Um, and then the 26% of victims are under 18. So there is a lot of initiative around the world to go after um, instances of child exploitation. And um, also, I'm anticipating the question that almost always comes up, which is, well, what's happening in the United States? What numbers are we talking about in the United States? And I like to use the Polaris Project's reporting um, for those numbers because they track hotline calls in specific cases of human trafficking. So they're not estimating, they're dealing with what they know um, is happening in the United States. So since 2007, Polaris has identified about 30,000 cases of trafficking in the United States so in the last 10 years, about 30,000 cases. And if we take a snapshot of their 2015 statistics, they reported 5,544 cases of human trafficking but 75% of those cases were sex trafficking. So we almost have a, 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 we have a mirror image in the United States where most of what's happening in terms of trafficking is sex trafficking in the United States, which is not true internationally. Another interesting point that, they, that Polaris makes is that victims are almost equally US citizens and foreign nationals. In fact, there are more US citizens who are victims of trafficking in the United States than foreign nationals. And then the estimated profit, how much is being made off of trafficking internationally? We've kind of been stuck for a while at this idea. It's about $150 billion a year annually comes from the fruits of trafficking. Um, I'll just back up. I just want to go this way, this way, this way. Go there. Um, and before we turn, um, uh, before I get to the next set, set part of our presentation, I want to talk briefly about what kinds of issues are in play or highly debated uh, among, especially in the United States, but internationally. One of the biggest ones is how should we address sex trafficking? What are the best strategies? And there are um, wide ranging approaches from um, going after the pimps, uh, the brokers, the um, Johns, the consumers of trafficking, to actually legalizing prostitution. So there's a wide range of debate and very vociferous, energetic debate about how, how should we go after sex trafficking. Another big issue at play is what should we do about supply chains? In, in, earlier on, I talked about all those manifestations of trafficking of, uh, that, that find their way into most human endeavors. So what can we do about that? What should businesses, what should governments, what should we as consumers be doing? Um, to address the trafficking that might very well be deep in the supply chains of what we use day to day. So those are some issues at play, and if we have time um, in the q and A, be happy to talk about that more. So on to the response of the church. We're at Notre Dame, so we really love to track this carefully. Um, and the church has been responding to, to trafficking for quite some time, but I'd like to focus on what Francis has said. So we have this wonderful chirograph of Pope Francis that he wrote in 2014 to his dear friend, um, fellow Argentine, Monsignor Marcelo, Marcelo Sanchez Sorando, who's the Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of the Social Sciences. And we have the translation in English. 
He says, Marcelo, I think it would be good to examine human trafficking and modern slavery. Organ trafficking could be examined in connection with hormone tra human trafficking. I think he read the Flammer Protocol because he mm -hmm. identified organ trafficking. Many thanks, Francis. So Francis has been on top of this and made a lot of pronouncements that reverberated around the world. Um, one of the most important ones was, was this quote. He said, human trafficking is an open wound on the body of contemporary society. It is a crime against humanity. So under his leadership at the Vatican, he's um, been involved in interfaith initiatives, such as the 2014 Joint Declaration of Religious Leaders Against Modern Slavery, an important uh, development. And then um, the, with Catholic bishops, conferences have launched a lot of anti-trafficking projects, such as the Santa Marta Commitment, which was signed by global um, police chiefs to fight trafficking. And even down to the parish level, you probably or may very well find examples of trafficking awareness initiatives in the United States. But this is where I get to pass the clicker <laughs> to Sister Anne. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I get to talk about the work of women religious on human trafficking. In 2001, internationally, U.S. Sisters leadership met in Rome and passed a resolution that was put forward by the Sisters from Asia and Africa. And the resolution called us to address insistently and at every level the sexual exploitation of women and children. You notice that this came at the very same time, practically, as the Palermo Protocol. What it did for us in the United States was it woke us up to human trafficking in our country, and it concentrated our efforts to address it everywhere. Sisters are engaged in insistent work at every level, on behalf of women and girls, men and boys, in every manner that trafficking manifests, as Chris laid out so beautifully for you. And in 2010, an international network of national networks of sisters was formed in Rome. It's called Talitha Kum, Arise. It comes from the scripture when Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus and said, Little girl, arise, Talitha Kum. So this represents 82 countries. We have 82 members representing 82 countries of sisters throughout the world. Shortly after that, in 2013, we formed our U.S. Uh, national group, the U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking, in April 2013. And here we are a collaborative faith-based national network that offers education, we support access to survivor services, and we engage in advocacy to eradicate modern-day slavery. We have close to 100 members, congregations, coalitions, and many individual partners who support our work. And we are the U.S. representative to Talitha Kuhn. I will share with you uh, later today, in a few moments, three stories of the work of Catholic sisters around the work, world that are characterized, as Chris said, by partnership. Um, Talitha Kuhn has allowed us to come together, to work together, to learn from one another. And we do have a sister who is the inspiration for our work. Some of you may be acquainted with Sister Josephine Bakita, who is a saint. Uh, she was a human trafficking victim herself. And Bakita is the name that was given to her by her traffickers. Ironically, it translates to fortunate one. Um, she was born in South Sudan in 1869 and sold into slavery by her family at the age of eight or nine. We're not exactly sure. But she was sold many times, and along the course of her young life, she was tortured to the point where she could no longer speak. She was not able to speak. Um, eventually, she was bought by an Italian family and brought to Italy by, by her owners. In Italy, she met the Kenosian Order of Sisters and uh, wanted to stay in Italy with them. Uh, but her family was returning to Sudan and wanted to take their property with them. She was their property. But the Bishop of Venice and the Sisters Order went to court to petition for her freedom, and they won because at that time, and at this time as well, slavery is outlawed in Italy. So, Nikita became a sister, 
and she lived a contemplative life, and she wrote her story at the encouragement of her superiors. She died in 1947, and in 2000, Pope St. John Paul II canonized her. Her feast day is February 8th, and in uh, 2013, Pope Francis asked the sisters, what could he do to raise the profile of human trafficking? And we said, we'd like an International Day of Prayer and Awareness. And he said, and when would you like it? And we said, February 8th. <laughs> so we're, this day is coming up. We'll be celebrating the Feast of St. Josephine Vakita on, on February 8th. And this coming year in 2017, as Chris said, the focus of this day will be child slavery. So now I'd like to tell you one story about a sister here in the US who's doing marvelous work on human trafficking. Here she is, her name is Sister Joan Dauber. She is a sister of Charity of Halifax. She is a soft-spoken, disarmingly charming, welcoming, proper British-born sister. Not the person that you would imagine uh, who goes and rescues women from sex or labor slavery, but that is what she does. And it's interesting how she got into this work. She was not initially drawn to it. She said it was really too dark and terrible. But several invitations came her way um, that she realized through prayer. News articles about human trafficking, a letter from congregational leadership raising the issue and calling for prayer and, and ministry in the area of human trafficking, uh, meetings with like-minded people, et cetera. And Sister Joan prayed about it, and as she prayed, she said she got stronger, and she realized that she could make a difference. And she came to believe that education and safe housing were the greatest needs for women, in this case for women, who had been trafficked. And she asked her congregation to leave parish ministry and be able to work full-time in human trafficking. And the congregation supported her. And they gave her some seed money. With that seed money, she formed a group. Again, we're talking about partnerships. Um, she went out and talked to the 35 different communities of women religious who are in the metropolitan New York area. And the 35 congregations came together and formed Lifeway Network. Um, and the members of Lifeway Network over the past nine years have given thousands of educational presentations on human trafficking. In the meantime, Joan also was visiting several safe houses and studying different models of services. And she decided for Lifeway Houses on what she calls the community model. And not only are the women given access to all the services they need to heal and become whole again, but uh, there's also a community of three sisters who lives in the house with the women. And um, at the end of the day, when all of their classes and their meetings and their appointments are over, there is a community to sit down, have dinner with, spend the evening with, who's able to say to them, how are you and how was your day? So it's a, it's a very good model that has worked really well for Lifeway Network. In 2012, they opened their first long-term care residence. And in April of 2016, they opened a second house. And these houses provide survivors with what Sister Joan believes they need above all else. And that is a place of safety. We have a little video clip of Sister Joan here. Sorry. So I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that um, appeared, spoke to me was um, I wanted a place uh, where women could know that they were safe and sleep deep. And one of our women has said that to us, yes, that Lifeway Network provided a place that she felt safe and for the first time in years can sleep deeply. So for me, that was such a, an affirmation of what we were trying to do. I just want to share with you uh, Joan's reflection on the successful work of her network. She says, if you look at it, 
only in the macrocosm, the enormity of modern day slavery can be paralyzing and bring us to a standstill. You wonder how you ever hope to make an impact, let alone eradicate this horror and bring it to an end. I believe that it's only by trusting in God and desiring to be an agent of change that change happens. Small efforts matter. And the small efforts we make today at this moment are of great value in the work of systemic change. We all must do what is ours to do in this present moment. We're going to move from the personal to the corporate now, and I want to share with you some stories of shareholder activism and corporate engagement on the part of U.S. Catholic Sisters. Um, there is a group in New York called the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility that coordinates shareholder action of churches and religious groups and pension services, many, many different groups, but it started with the religious communities in 1971, and Sisters were in this work from the very beginning. Uh, we engaged our shareholder rights with corporations in our portfolios on issues such as human rights, environment, gender and racial equality, corporate governance, international health, and more. So this is a natural venue for us to address human trafficking. We're now engaged with many companies, and here are some of them. on several aspects of human trafficking, including sex and labor trafficking, worker rights in global supply chains, labor recruitment fees, conflict minerals, and more. I wanna share two short success stories. One is Hershey's. Uh, we began a dialogue with the Hershey company regarding labor trafficking in the cocoa fields in Ivory Coast in 2005. And after